So, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It's wonderful to be here today, just a couple of blocks from where I'm based. And um, Lucas Associates has always been disruptive. <laughs> We've been going for 40 years and we're not stopping. <laughs> so, um, we're currently reminding the country, you might have heard RNZ today, but also the profession and the educators, we need to nurture this land of milk and honey. How does it operate next? Ooh wee. So, more Titi Island. You might have seen in the news this week, we won the Court of Appeal. I, um, you know, I come from a, a understanding that the land runs under the, the sea, the landscape continues beneath the ocean, and I did a landscape assessment first when the arena, um, I was involved when the arena went down out here in the Bay of Empty, as my clients call it, um, and then for the regional coastal plan and assessed the marine landscape. And it's an underdone thing. I, I first did one oh, about 15, 20 years ago. I get guys to dive things and we do it. So the marine landscape's really important, but it's been ignored by the profession largely. And luckily, the judge uh, agreed. There's no difference in the RMA between the land and the sea. We've got a responsibility to manage. So the, the fishing that is wrecking the kelp forests, just the same as the possums, you know, wreck the, um, the uh, landfall or the bulldozers, the terrestrial forests, the, the fishing wrecks, the kelp forests through taking out the snapper, which means the kinna multiply hugely and the, and the kelp forests get destroyed. Yet kelp grows, you know, one species grows half a metre a day. They're massive carbon stores. So we need to be nurturing, we need to be managing, the marine landscape and recognising the importance of the blue belt around our wonderful islands. And on the land, similarly with our wetlands, we need to be recognising the importance of wetlands, not only for biodiversity, for mahi and kai, for you know, nutrients and so on, but as a carbon store. Not, not peatlands, but these alluvial wetlands. And so that's one, no, Warwick Moffat's not, he won't be here, did this plan for, a plan for this wetland for me about 97, and it's moving really well in the south bank, there's Timaru, and that catchment and all coming into that wetland there. Um, and as we all know in this room, Harakiki are an important plant of wetlands and of wetlands throughout the um, country. And you might have seen Rosine put up a colour range last week from the citizen science that I ran last summer when I asked people to explore the colour of the harakiki flowers around Aotearoa, New Zealand. Because decades ago, I was told a whakatauki that said that it, the harakiki had a different flower colour on each mountain range. And so I thought it's time we explored it. So I got citizen science out there um, through, I got into the forest from Bird Mag, went online, and we got a really lovely colour range come out. And they've just launched it last week. And that's their words, not mine. Um, and um, what is interesting is that since then, since I did that, I've been told of a whakatauki that talks about the colours of the harakiki flowers relating to the health of the water. And I, wow, isn't that interesting? So if we looked at the pH of the water affecting harakiki flowers, you know, baby, you didn't, you know, put, have your babies anywhere near water for certain um, flower colours. So um, I, we all know about the, the hydrangea response to pH, so do harakiki flowers also respond to pH? So, not just thinking about harakiki flowers, because they're only short season, um, you know, you can't read them all year when you're out doing your landscape surveys, 
but perhaps as a profession, we could be looking for indicator plants that respond to different, to different pH, to different nutrients, and see if we can set up to have um, indicators into um, landscape planning, landscape design, as a response to the health of the waters. Um, I've been quite involved in a concern over the response to the uh, climate change and need to sequester carbon and the uh, blanket pine plantations that have gone in um, and that are being encouraged and subsidised because we've done work that show it's actually a band-aid to nowhere. <laughs> There's a curtain. Um, they, you know, they're cropping in that. You can look online now at the website. I won't deal with it now, I've got eight minutes. But because you have to cut down the pines and they get transported off, made into toilet paper, everything, they've got a half life of four years, a pine tree grown in New Zealand. That is not sequestering. The ones being planted now will be all gone, all over by 2050. No sequestration, zero. That is a useless scheme. So we need to change that. Instead, as <laughs> Hugh Wilson did, many of you will know him, and you hopefully seen the documentary Fools and Dreamers. He, you know, got we got destocked out there, and the recovery of the forest, the regenerating forest, is fantastic. That is the best one. So that's the honey part. We need to be <laughs> nurturing the regeneration. That is a much better carbon solution for New Zealand than pine forests. And it's like 1.4 million hectares all ready to you know, burst forth, so let's do it. So if we have the recovered ones, we can look at the multiple values of the regenerative, as we do in landscape practice, recognise those diversity of values. And we all know that these landscapes with regeneration exhibit those. Um, last year I thought, you know, with the whole climate change and with the water issues and everything, the lack of um, uh, farm planning with landscape architects is alarming. So we explored, could we do it? So we looked at a block down in Central Targa and a method that I think is really, really good, use ecological districts. What are the ecological regions and districts of New Zealand? Because that gives you a context. You know, something like, yeah, we work all over New Zealand and you need to know the character of the location. Ecological regions and districts is a good, good method. And also, as you would have heard me going on for decades, land typing. So here we land type down We've got the land type and the landscape type at the broad scale, the land type, down to the landform components applied at the farm scale. Whoops, don't know what's happened to my farm plans. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to. Right, oh, I'll t have to tell you. I should go head back here. So, um, I must have done a move and not done the paste. Sorry about that. Um, so, we addressed, did a plan to address the water issues and did a planting plan and we've done an assessment we can put this with still grazing cattle and sheep to carbon zero by putting woody planting on 40% of the land but that doesn't mean it excludes stock necessarily from 40% because some of it can be space tree crops. So um, it was good, so that was a beef and sheep one, and I was thrilled to say, wow, we can, we can do carbon zero farm plans and still have cattle and sheep. And I think that's really cool. So, where? Well, here we are. What's happening in New Zealand is so crazy, isn't it? I mean, the gas guzzling country we are is phenomenal. Oops, here's my plans. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so you see here the planting arrangement. Sorry. You see there, that's the planting and addressing that. And there's a a uh, plant-based option, uh, a plant crop one instead, instead of a grazed one as an alternative, and that comes into a carbon credit. So there's all the figures. If you want to find it on our integrated farm plan website, 
all the figures are there for the analysis of it. So then I thought, well, we can do it in, in uh, sheep and beef. In the city, you know, everybody's so blimmin' critical of farming, and you think, well, here we are. So this is my place, Murray Harper. Perhaps you want to wander around there later, just around here. I don't have good sense of direction. But yeah, it's around there. Um, so, and a student, uh, Grant's just drawn this up yesterday. Um, so, with my place in the central city, I try and look at those things. I look at the energy. I look at at the you know transport. At you know you try and measure manage those things as I'm sure a responsible client, you know, audience that we have here all do. And you think about the black water, you flush the toilet and it goes off to Bromley and it is made into, you know, it's processed there in the big digester. So there they have this big biosolids, there's all this stuff and everything is used and it's clean water that goes out, right? So, I thought, well, back in the old days, <laughs> when I set up practice <laughs> 40 years ago, I used to do farm plans, and yeah, obviously I had to join in the odd activity hours. I was a raft race I had to join in on, learned to drink a decent sized bottle of beer. And <laughs> um, so I looked at it, uh, I thought about what we were doing, and I looked at the ETS. Now, uh, Students drawn that up for me overnight. So Shane, what is the ETS saying in our landscape? Sorry. And um, so I thought, can we look at dairy? So we have. And I've worked with dairy farmers again. I thought I'd deleted these. Ecological districts, land typing, centre pivot irrigation, effluent spray the usual Canterbury dairy farm. The sort of 1,200 cows, you know, a, a family farm. And um, so we looked at the emissions, measured all the emissions, and um, looked at planting. So if we plant the corners, you know, like space walnuts and, and pot lilies on, and native forest, and on the terrace of native forest, and then if we run woody food bands up to 2.6 metre high of a pivot irrigator um, right through, so can you see parallel bands through? If we do that through all the pivots, good woody food forest bands, people like, they want to grow food, they like growing food. So we do that, all planted up, we can get right we can uh, just drop a, a hundred cows and um, reduce the emissions significantly. But the next stage, and I'm trying to be quick here, is put in a biodigester. And so we can easily meet the 2030 target for farms by just that bit of planting. So it's no big deal. Might have heard otherwise, but it is not. So. Um, this next one is, so, build a biodigester and put half the cows in, in a herd home 75% of the time and we reduce the emissions way down. And then we found, if we take the, the um, so we can get all the, um, you can grow algae and the digester, you put that onto the feed for the cows and we could have it out in troughs, um, in the paddocks for when they're outside, uh, that stops them burping. And we can get the emissions right down. We have got, did you hear RNZ today? The run was on this today and I've had a lot of <laughs> calls and stuff. So, <laughs> and the offers of biodigesters and all sorts of stuff, so it's really nice. Um, so there we are, right down to just with those steps, there, just that amount of planting, you could do more. So that's down to just 26% of the emissions. So it's way past the Zero Carbon Act, as of yesterday, is saying 
go down to 26 to 47 percent, that is way down, way lower than that. So we can do it. We can absolutely do it. So it's been pretty exciting uh, finding this. Okay. And we, the planning for that. So the plans involved in doing that, we can enrich, we can address as landscape architects, we can address all of the dimensions. We can address the biodiversity. We can address the nutrients. We can address the mahingakai. We can address all of those because our role is to knit it all together. That's why we have a, a logo of an endless knot. It's about all intertwined. And landscape architects are the one that can knit, ones that can knit it together. So I'm saying, get in behind. Or, uh, 